Great to be with you, Matt. My name is Hugh Agrill, the CEO and President of Revival Gold. We're advancing the Bear Track RNF Gold Project located in Idaho in the Western United States. My name is Philip Cloussier, and I'm uh, President and CEO of Cartier Resources. We're a gold explorer in the Abu Dhabi Greenstone Belt. Our flagship is the Chimo Mine Project. Gerald Panetton, I'm the Chairman and CEO of Gold Terra Resources, and we're working in the Northwest Territory on the Yellowknife. Uh, project. We just have an option to purchase the gold, the calm mine, which produced 6 million ounces at 15 to 20 gram gold. Um, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us today. We're going to be talking about gold. We're going to be talking about the gold environment and also what we investors should be thinking and doing in the, in the kind of current uh, monetary environment, which is, involves sanctions, monetary policy, deglobalization, possible recession, supply chain problems. It's all very confusing. We're, we're all a little bit of a risk off at the moment hoarding cash. But I guess the question I'm asking is, should we be? And, you know, and what's the timing for uh, maybe changing our thinking? So, um, I think what would help us is maybe Hugh, what do, what do you CEOs do in an environment like this? Do you change your thinking? Do you have to adapt? Do you have to be agile? I think you've got a, a group of really experienced CEOs here who've been through a few cycles. And so it's a, it's a good group to bounce uh, ideas and thoughts off of for sure. Uh, look, in, in, in my experience, in my 30 years in this business, the one thing I can say for sure is that you can never predict exactly when the gold price is going to move. And the best place to focus is on one's assets and advancing those assets through the cycle and making sure that one doesn't make short-term decisions that impair long-term uh, value creation for shareholders. So we're focused on exploration, adding ounces, and we're doing it at a time when those ounces are and never have never been more in, in need or in demand by large gold producers who are in fantastic financial condition, generating uh, oodles of cash and in need of projects to replace their pipelines. What, do you, what, what about you, Philip? I think uh, Hugh is absolutely right. And he touched on a, a concept of remaining relevant as a, a junior company. And being relevant means being able to look at the district, the mining district that we've been through in several cycles and looking at hard at these projects and looking at them with 25 years of technological advancements and innovations in the mining industry. You just, like Gerald with Detour Gold, uh, the group at Canadian Malarctic and half a dozen other projects in the Abitibi got back into production and yet none of them was a new discovery. They were just projects that had been shelved in difficult economic times or lack of metallurgical techniques and they were looked at differently and then came along a, um, a, a, a cash boom and they took that cash and we took these projects, we delineated them, got them permitted and back into production. I think that's what the, the bright new exploration companies are doing to provide the senior producers with the ounces that they desperately need in the next five to 10 years. What about you, Jarel? Because you, you know you've you've just um, taken over the running of, of this company, and you've talked to me in the past about having to look forward into you know uh, planning about when this is a mine. Where do I need the plant? Where do I need the tailing supplies? You, you know, you you're always thinking ahead. But what are you doing in this environment? Well, I'm definitely not putting the shovel in the ground. That's the one thing. Uh, if there is one thing I would want to do in this current market is building a mine when cost cost escalation is to the roof. I mean, we went from $30 oil to $120 oil in this very short term. Our job as CEO is very simple. Uh, we need to deliver value for our shareholders. There's no question. We need to create ad ounces. But we also, at the same time, look, I, I built Detour Gold in the best gold timing I could ever have dreamed of building a company. This is different time. It's tough. But at the end of the day, we have a very good project. We are still able to finance. We are still able to drill. Uh, we're still able to contribute on the answers. And we have to adapt to the market. Like, I've never predicted gold in my life. I don't do that. I live with the cycle we're in. I adapt and I deliver. That's a very good point. And, and one of the things we have to adapt to is uh, in, inflation not only touches costs and materials, it, it touches uh, available manpower. And, 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 you know, engineers, geologists, metallurgists, it, and, and that we're being severely impacted right now. And, and Gerard is right. If you were thinking of putting a mine into production, 
well, good luck. You have to coach experienced people from other companies, and you're just gonna you're just gonna level up the prices and, and the salaries. Right. Okay. But so, so costs are going up, inflation's going up, but it's, affa- it's affecting everything. Is that is that the biggest concern, or is it more sentiment? Because if if I'm a contrarian investor, I'm looking at this market and going, "There's bargains to be had. I should be buying right now." But they're not. So, is sentiment more a killer um, for you know exploration companies than you know the economic situation we find ourselves in? What do you reckon, Hugh? Yeah, look, uh, v- venture investors by nature um, uh, speculate and are uh, prone to short-term thinking. And again, going back to some of the, the you know the thoughts echoed by by Gerard and Philippe, uh, you, you know, one needs to take a longer-term view. And it, there is some there is some uh, control over when we uh, decide to go into production. Um, but remember, in the last Five years, the price of gold's up eighty percent, as well as uh, the costs of uh, many other things. So, the margins uh, move around a little bit, but overall, take our industry as a whole. Uh, we are generating a lot of cash: five percent free cash flow, two to four percent dividends in, among the senior gold companies. And I think uh, what is more likely to happen at a, at a point in time when there's a, a scarcity of capital is consolidation. And, and, and rationalization to try and address some of these uh, ch- uh, challenging operating issues that uh, Philip has touched on, drills availability, people availability, uh, engineering firm availability, uh, all, all of those things. I think uh, part of it's going to be addressed through consolidation. Right. Okay. And, and and that's fine for the people who've got the money there in control of their decision making and, and their choices. You know, and Gerald, you you've you've been at been at, on that side of the fence. When you're when you're looking at the market right now, do you go, actually, I'm gonna wait just a little bit longer, as as potentially we investors are doing too, to kind of see what comes out in the wash? Because some companies are gonna be under stress, caught, you know. Development companies are going to be under stress. The cost of capital's got a little bit more expensive. The margins have got, potentially got a little bit smaller. So, you know, again, how do you react in this environment, Gerald? We're, we're not developing. Uh, we're in a situation where we're adding values. We have a threshold. Uh, we want to get to see three to four good million ounces of gold at a good grade. Uh, we already, if you ask me, where do you want to put the plan? I already know where to put it. This is no question. So I, I could start my baseline study on the environmental. Uh, it's very simple. We, we know so well the, the I didn't know three years ago, but of course, after two years and a half in Yellowknife, uh, we know exactly what to do. And I surround myself with very good people that we make very good decision. But there's a timing. I mean, you don't want to be raising money to build a mine today. You don't want you don't want to be if I was just looking at the it's a it's a funny parallel housing market. Okay, housing market like went by 30 to 40 to 50 percent in some area. If you build a mill, you have a thousand people working on the mill that wants to buy a more expensive house. All the costs, inflation will go up. It's not going to come down tomorrow morning. Are we seeing something that we saw in the 70s where it took about five, six years for the gold to jump? Because everything else will be very expensive before gold, such as copper, oil. Remember the 70 crisis? And 81 gold, we went from you know a very low gold to 800. This is like almost like a 15 times. Uh, I don't predict gold is going to go five thousand dollars, but what I'm saying is that these days, if you're not building, you're lucky. Yeah, sorry, I jump jump, jump in uh, here quickly and 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 point out that you know some jurisdictions will be more impacted by inflationary pressures on things like energy and. And so on, and, and and borrowing one of you know Gerard's uh, uh, pages from one of his playbooks. Uh, for us at Revival Gold, we focused on a brownfield site with existing infrastructure, power to site, hydro, uh, no requirement to generate electricity, uh, people available locally without having to build a camp, and all of those things are advantages when you're in an, an inflationary environment to help you manage costs. So I think investors can do the same thing as they look into very various jurisdictions, look to those projects where uh, uh, fuel costs are less impactful and where people availability is uh, less an issue. 
Well, that's a really, yeah. that's, can, can I just, sorry, Philip, let me, if you don't mind if I jump in here, because I think it's a really important point that's been made by Hugh, which is some of these development companies are going to be constrained by the cost of capital. People very quickly overlook things, simple things like that. But, you know, in, in, I guess in banking terms, or if you're modeling this thing, the cost of your capital on marginal projects is very, very meaningful. So, I mean, Hugh, in your case, you've kind of inherited a sort of quite a large sort of set of infrastructure. Um, what's that done for you? Have you actually worked out what the savings are for you or what, what, it, what it does to your bottom line? Yeah, it's, it's 40 to $50 million. Uh, 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 you know, on a replacement value, it's much more than that. But uh, in terms of what it saves us uh, on a restart cost for the project, and you know that's that's fifty percent, forty fifty percent of our our current uh, PEA capital costs. So it's a big number, and I, ca I can't emphasize enough also the aspect around transportation of people, uh, availability of power. Those things are very important too. And as investors focus more and more on ESG friendliness, the low carbon footprint's another aspect to this. Now again, I if I I I, I want to nod to uh, Gerard uh, for. Uh, his efforts in respect to bringing the detour project back to life. We've seen uh, some of these others like Malarctic, uh, Philippe mentioned, uh, Hale in, uh, in the U.S. is another example. And, and those are the projects that I think uh, can keep giving. Uh, it's the old adage, where you find gold, there's a, a lot more to be found. Right. Yeah, and, and this was a you've quote. Got three, it's what you've Bob got three projects here, one in Yellowknife, one in Idaho, and one in Val d'Or. And you could keep adding value with basic paper engineering and not committing yourself to a shovel in the ground where you don't know where the inflationary, you know, the, you know, the added costs are going to go. So you could keep adding project for uh, value to your project and keep building ounces and the time will come. I mean, nobody is going to, nobody, no senior company is ever going to deny the value of ounces in the ground. They don't rust. They stay there. And when the time comes, they get mined. And, and, and as a junior company, there's, there's the investment opportunity as well. And so, Gerald, you were going to say something. No, it's okay. I mean, uh, you know, like, like working in a brownfield environment has always been a certain advantage. And, uh, of course, if you're uh, one of the biggest challenge I had when we were building uh, Detour was to be compared with Kennedy's in Malarctic from, you know, apple to apple, basically. But one apple was in town and it was easy to, to crop. Well, my apple was like, I had to build a camp. I had, my GE was way out of line compared to Malartic. And instead of having 300 employees, I had 800 employees because I had to do rotation. So you see, every project has its own challenge, its own value. Uh, but to go back to the current situation, we, we all agree it's it would be tough to develop today, but if you're in a good environment to be able to do this, you can still do it. I mean, I was just reading the Silver Crest update they're doing in Mexico. It's not a big mine. They're doing it. So, But if I was building Cote Lake, I would scratch my back. I would worry about that project more, you know, because if you build a hundred to $200 million project and you end up with 20% contingency over what you plan, out of your contingency uh, pocket, it's 240. But 20% on the billion, it's more, it's 200 million. And raising money in these days, we saw Ascot go down the drain with Sprout Landing. Look, what I'm trying to say is that it is not the best time to build. It doesn't mean you cannot build, but it depends a lot on your project. Absolutely, but just again, give me some clues as an investor. There's things I should be looking at, and we're so we're focusing a little bit on producers at the moment. I, I think we need to come back into exploration, etc. But just on that, mar mar marginal marginal projects are yeah, they're hard, they're hard to define for the average retail investor, high net worth family office. Is like, well, what do you mean by marginal project? It's it's people go straight to the grade and they go right, grade, grade is king. Yeah. But there's more to it than that, isn't there, Hugh? Yeah, look, there's a, there's a few things, and uh, my colleagues here have uh, touched on them, but uh, let me point them out. Uh, capital structure and making sure there's enough money in the company that, in which you're investing is, is really important because you don't want that company to be beholden to the, to the markets in a stressful time. Uh, streams and royalties impair the value of those assets. Great is great, but if you've impaired the value of that asset with streams and royalties that are, that are going to cause problems uh, for decision-making down the road, 
I think that limits uh, success, the possibility of success for investors. Having the right people involved and being in the right jurisdictions, all three of the companies represented here are in excellent tier one jurisdictions. You do not want to be in a jurisdiction that's problematic or that's um, uh, potentially more prone to inflationary impacts due to currency exchange rate changes, problems getting people, uh, those sorts of things. So there are things external to the project when you're looking at these companies to uh, focus in on for lower risk, higher potential returns in a, in a market environment like we're in. Right, but Hugh, let me ask you this. I'm going to stick with Hugh for a second, which is you you walked into a pro you chose this project that you're on now in Idaho, right? You've you've got some historic data there. You know your team's got a, a you know track record of success. Um, you know you're you're not learning on a job, right? So you chose to walk into this um, advanced exploration story because why? What were the boxes it ticks for you, and do, are those boxes still ticked given the environment we're in today? Yeah. Thank you. So returns are one thing. Uh, we've, got a, we've got a return. It's 1750 gold of uh, I don't know, 37% uh, IRR. But CapEx has to be manageable. So staying below some threshold of a meaningful you know, CapEx makes the project less risky. Having people who've run that project before or who are of deep familiarity with it, or where you have technical data with respect to that asset, makes it less risky. And it, in, in, a, in the case of something like Cote uh, Lake, which uh, Gerald uh, brought up, you know, there isn't specific knowledge of how the rock is going to respond, the site's going to respond. It's, it's a brand new mine, it's a, it's, a, it's a new site, and it's a huge capital number that can blow up uh, on, on the operator. So, the, that would be under the bucket of more risky. We've chosen something less risky and um, our returns and margins are, are there. But uh, what I'm saying is returns and margins need to be looked at in the context of the overall risk environment. Quebec is a great place to operate. The, U uh, the uh, Northwest Territory is a great place to operate. Uh, and we know how the levels of costs are gonna be in those environments and how people are gonna respond and work. Uh, so sticking to known mining jurisdictions is another way to reduce risk uh, as you think about investing in the sector. Right, and then and Philippe, if I look at you, your model's slightly different from the other guys, right? You, you, you're building things to, to uh, sell or to, you know, or at least get some kind of JV situation in on. So you only need to take it so far. So in a way, does that mean you stop having to look out into the distance or because you're going to have to negotiate a situation with a JV partner or an, or an acquisitor, you also need to have those considerations in place. I mean, how, how do you come at it? You, you always want the option of building it yourself. That's, that's obvious or else you're basically going to be held hostage by the local producers. Uh, we're fortunate because along the highway, there's half a dozen you know, senior gold producers and half a dozen mine uh, mills that are, you know, they could take the, the, the stuff. So you build your own mill or you toll mill it. And, and so, but the advantages that Hugh uh, and, and Gerald have on their projects that we have as well is the huge amount of historical data. You're not starting from scratch. You know your rock mechanics, you know your metallurgical behavior, you know your geology. And these, these are things that have been uh, project killers in the past. So when you could profit from excess of 4,000 diamond drill holes and, 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 you know, in your immediate environment, you have brain power that have seen and solved problems at other mines and, and things, you know, um, it's, it's, that's a lot of value. That's something that you could bank on that remote projects are just discovering and they will discover that that costs a lot you know, to, to attain. Okay, and then Cheryl, Cheryl if, if I may, you built mines before, you, you built three mines before, you, you're determined, you're very clear, you're gonna build another one here. So again, when you look, when you came into this project, what did you see? Because you're a consultant to this company for, you know, for a couple, you know, a couple of years before you kind of stepped in as, uh, and took over, right? So- not, not a consultant, I, I did my due diligence, right. and then I joined as the chairman. Right. Okay. So, right. It was due diligence. It wasn't under a consultancy agreement. Okay. Uh, so, you, you chairman, but you stepped in. You said, "Right, I can do this better." Right. So, what gives you the confidence? What gave you the confidence? What were you looking at? Uh, I, I like I like your uh, your question because you know 
uh, for any of us when we decide to get involved into a project. You know, it's like when I, I, I made my, my case on evaluating Detour in about three hours. I wanted to have 100%. What? And I wanted to have 100%. And we, we managed to get the deal done. It took six months. It was a brand new IPO. And to go back to one of you, uh, uh, you know, comment, it was a brand new vehicle. I call that a brand new car out of the shop with fresh money. The challenge in our industry is that when you have a fresh vehicle, a fresh project, people have patience. And when you have, you're down the line three years, four years, five years. And, and that was the issue. I actually recommended the guy. Uh, they didn't want to take my ID. And unfortunately, uh, today I'm, I've got a vehicle that has 220 million share instead of maybe 40 or 50. And so it's much harder to raise money at those low level. And, and as you know, if you do a consolidation, they always hit you. So it's better to put that into a fresh. And that's the success of Detour Gold. One of the biggest success was not to find 20 million ounces, it was the vehicle. Okay. What attracted me in Yellowknife is high grade. Don't ask me exactly why I don't want to do a low grade because it's, it's very negative. Unless you're in the States and you're doing an e-bleach. I go high grade because grade is king. I'm in Yellowknife because everybody goes home at night. You have to look at all the economic parameters of a project in its location to assess the value. We can talk about Old Bay Belt, for example. I was on Old Bay Belt like 25 years ago, before anybody, when BHP was selling it, and I said, no, we're not buying it because the cost of drilling is $350 per meter, all in 26 years ago. Okay. I evaluated, I know that. And we decided not to buy uh, Obey Bell for less than $5 million. Can't be exguarded. And you can look at the story of a difficult project. That's a very case, a good case story. So you learn from, and you're very lucky you're sitting with three guys that have been around for a long time. I mean, there's more than 100 years around the table today of experience of building mine in different locations. When I left Barrick, I said, I will never build a mine again in Africa. I did it. I did it twice, but I, I left. And I said, I'm not going back because I like to speak the language. So investor, when they invest in companies, whatever, it's you company, Philips company, or, or our company, Golterra, they have to scrutinize the people, the location, the grade, uh, the the knowledge, the, loca the, the, the location is like real estate. It's king. Everybody goes home at night. It, it's, look, I'm, I'm, I'm probably going to be able to start a mine, a 5,000 ton per day mill, small open pit, underground, high grade. My open pit is six gram, 300,000 ounces. So what do you put the mill? You put the mill closer to the pit and you truck 1,000 ton per day at uh, 15 grams. So you, the, we, we have all these things in our mind. But look, this morning, we released 32 grams over three meters. What's the reaction on the market? Nothing. And it's an extension. It's actually a new zone in a, in a new area that we're just starting to drill. But, th but that's my point. That that's my point. Pe people are terrified of making a decision at the moment because they're not quite sure what the economic environment looks like. And what I'm looking to you guys to say to me is, like, we've been through one or two of these cycles before. I say lots of experience around the table. And what happens at the other side is the following, right? But that can be done when you've got strong fundamentals. So I'm looking for clues as to what those strong fundamentals are. So, Gerald, I'm sorry, I know you just spoke for a while there, Gerald, but, uh, but I, need, I need to ask you, you made a decision to buy detail off, off the back of, after three hours. So I'm guessing people, location, grade, and cost of capital came into, into the discussion. Was there anything else that no, allowed you to make a decision? It was it was 1 million ounces of gold in resource mm -hmm. from the calcite pit. The mine was shut down in 98 when gold was about $258 an ounce. Right. So I don't walk away. People start drilling. But what it needed is a big, sustainable drill program. And I was very lucky. Look, I do an IPO. I raised 10 million uh, share at $3.50. I got 35 million. I go in 2008. I just had raised money at $16 a share, 4 million share. I go into September to wait, the stock is $3 from 20 in June, but I have $70 million in the bank. I didn't have to worry about anything during Detour. That's why I said I, I, we did Detour Gold in one of the best time that we've seen through our career. 
like our career, my career started in 81. So over the last 40 years, I can tell you, this was the best timing I ever had in my life to build a mine and a company. And today, to be honest with you, I have a very old vehicle that needs fresh tires, oil change, and, and all that, these kind of difficult things to move the vehicle to raise the money I want. If I could have $20 million, I'll deliver you, to you 5 million ounces much faster. That's my challenge. Matt, there's the economic environment that we operate in, right, as junior uh, CEOs. Uh, and there's, there's the investor environment. I mean, tw- I've been in this business over 35 years, and the investors that we had 35 years ago are now 70 or 80 years old, and they're moving out. We've, I don't think we've educated a new uh, group of investors, and I, I'm having trouble imagining how do I connect with a millennial? And he's just been through Bitcoin and cannabis, and now he's going through Ukraine and inflation. He's having young kids. So the five ten thousand dollars he would have put in the stock market, now he's putting in a bassinet or you know, uh, you know, his his hockey equipment. So there, it, it's raising awareness in this transitionary times that I'm, you know, that as CEOs we have to, and and we're we must walk the line. We can't overpromise and underdeliver. We have to do exactly what we're saying we're going to do. So, where's that investor environment right now? Well, that, that, that's that's, that's a good that's, 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 that's a, it's a question you guys have got to answer. And what what we've seen actually, COVID has actually in many ways been your friend in the sense that you guys have had to up your game in terms of narrative communication, regularity of communication, written communication, um, and talking to your shareholders more because you didn't really have any options. You, you, There's 1,200 companies doing that, Matt. So then, then the noise level goes up and, and, and some of us, right? Some of us have to, we, you know, we're, we're, we're at risk of losing our titles here if uh, like a, a PGO so, and others can just foam off at the mouth. So it's not a level playing field. I'd, I'd agree with that, but I think the people who do it better will win, and it's it's a more important facet. It, yes, you've got to have the right people technically, and yes, you've got to have the right people financially and you, in terms of connecting to the markets, um, so the institutional markets, but also retail market. And I think that the companies have done that well, have done a little bit better than others um, in, in this environment, but you know, that's a conversation for another day. Hugh, I want to come back to you. Um, you know, To be able to know what to do, you must also know what not to do. What's, so what's your take on maybe why some companies have not, done as well as they could have in the, say, in, in, in the exploration space. Yeah, so it comes down to people. We've talked around that uh, already and the experience of those people. But I'm, I'm, I want to stress again, it's that short-term thinking versus long-term thinking that makes the difference ultimately in, in how successful we can be for our investors. You know, step back a minute. We're in an industry with about six dozen producer companies, royalty companies, about a tenth of those, call it half a dozen, are large global uh, enterprises. We've got another two dozen intermediate companies that uh, produce uh, quite a bit of gold, and then another, you know, three dozen junior producers. So there are a lot of companies in the space, and every single one of them is literally digging themselves into a hole with every ounce of gold they produce. They need those ounces replaced. And what we tend to forget in the industry time and time again is that it takes good geology, uh, time, and excellent execution on engineering and development to produce a, a successful gold mine. It takes time, it takes money. And so what happens is you go through these cycles uh, like we're in right now, where the average value of a gold deposit in the ground has gone from $80 an ounce to $40 an ounce. And, 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 there's, and there's value in the space. Uh, and all of a sudden what's going to happen, I can tell you from experience, those senior gold companies, those producers that need to fill their, uh, their, their cupboards, are going to be in a scramble and just as urgently as they are uh, leaving the sector right now, investors are shy for the sector right now, they will come flocking back and and we will be in another detour-like moment uh, where the the money is available because the projects are needed. And in the meantime, you've got companies like uh, Cartier and like uh, ours 
and like Gerald's that are putting together those ounces in the ground. In our case, Revival Gold has 4 million ounces of the ground that we built up over the last uh, four years, five years, at a finding cost of $5 an ounce. Even if we're trading at only 10 or $15 an ounce, we're making money for our shareholders doing that. And the average takeover price for a gold company of our, of our type is in the order of $65 an ounce. So there's a lot of value being created by companies like ours. Investors are gonna have to be patient, that's true. But the cycle uh, uh, will come back and it always does on the back of uh, industry demand. Right. Okay, here's one for you. Child, you're the guy for this. Um, there's a report came out, um, or sorry, sorry, some commentary from a fund manager called James Penny um, talking about uh, ESG uh, companies. He, he's basically saying that ESG invest, the ESG investment industry as a whole uh, may be heading for a, a reckoning. Many companies won't survive um, this period of higher interest rates. Um, and there will be sort of um, ESG companies that go to the wall as a result, because I think ESG is the big discussion of the, of, of the moment. There's people sitting on both sides of that argument going, is, is it good? Is it, quite frankly, a rehash of what was already there? Where, where do you sit in this argument? And what, what do you think is actually going to mean for you know the miners, whether it be developers or actual producers going forward? Your buyer? Well, you know, um ESG is an interesting world because, you know, after you build three mines, you know, you know, those words more than anybody else. And so, and, and I will, I was just going to, what I learned by working in Africa, especially in Tanzania, when we build those two mines, is that when I travel, I'm a guest. I listen to people before because I don't know them and they're my host and I need to learn from them. ESG starts with a good, proper attention to the detail and to the people in your surrounding. Of course, you look at, I'm going to give you an example. We, we used to own Kennings in Malartic, by the way, if you didn't know. Okay, it was called to make waters. And, and the reason we did not develop it, despite the fact there was more than 2 million ounces on Kennings in Malartic, it's because two people at Barrick didn't want to touch the city. Didn't want to move anybody in the town. We knew all about that. I, I can point you to the two people who did all the feasibility study for that prior to McWaters buying it in 2001. Look, ESG is three things. It's, and it's, it's your environmental respect. It's your social respect. It's your license to operate in any area in the world. And you better know where you are and you better understand everything. So you got to listen. You got to meet people. You have to have some town meetings. Uh, for you, is probably going to be advancing his project faster than mine, being where he is at now. Murray is at his threshold to to start thinking about developing the project. We're not there yet, but we already did on the ground. Like when I, you know, first question I was asked in Cochrane when I showed up uh, in 2007 was. So, uh, are you going to include Cochrane in your development per per perspective? And I'm sitting in front of 200 people and I'm just starting to drill. Because, you know, the bus from Timmins never stopped in Cochrane to go to the mine. Yeah. I, I still remember that, that comments yeah. in, in front of 200 people. And I said, listen, Cochrane is closer to the mine. And... If we can do something for Cochrane, we will. And that's exactly where we put the office. That's exactly where the bus stop. Didn't go to Timmins. It's the little, little things sometimes, isn't it? There's, there's two ESG environment. Uh, there's, the, there's the retail investor. And if you ask him if he's buying a stock because of ESG, I don't think the answer is yes. Then there's the institutional investor. If he's buying the stock because you've got good ESG, and his answer will be yes, but he's just basically ticking off the boxes. What Gerald pointed to is fundamentally common sense. As explorers, we're front line. I don't know anybody front line, anybody walking into somewhere disrespecting local community. And we're all set up in our local communities. And so the, the first thing you have to ask yourself is, what are their concerns? If you address their concerns, you're not going to have any problems. And then, and, and 
But again, if, if we're talking about the individual retail investor, I don't really think he, because every other junior will have that ESG slide, right? Uh, what does it mean? If you're, if you're doing it in the field every single day, then you're okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, 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 you can be, but I think there's also perhaps, um, there's, there's a lot of enthusiasm by some, some groups, no matter what the company okay, does. Hold on. You, you were saying though, that these funds are, they're, they're these, these massive funds, ESG funds are, are not beneficiating on the market. Well, that's fine. From our perspective though, ESG is fundamental because if you haven't done your, if you haven't done your homework well, and you've been extremely delinquent. Well, when that senior company comes in to buy you out, it will it will buy you at a discount because it has to clean up your mess. So you're, you're doing it because it's part of the value of the project and because it's common sense. It just needs to be done. But as for these ESG funds, I don't know what they're selling. What are they selling? It's like these carbon credit funds. What are they selling? Yeah, I guess there's, there's there's a kind of plethora of different services out there, and I think I think that, you know part of this is the fact that th- there will be a, a huge amount of these consultants benefiting. Um, but I'm trying to, what I'm trying to work out is uh, at what point do, do the companies benefit by you know going going down that track or not going down that track? Because uh, ESG will mean different things to different people, right? Look, the reality is that the explorationists are the first people on the scene, and they are the they are the ambassador, the, in some cases, the general manager of the operation, but also the mayor of the town, or might as well be the mayor of the town for, for all the good that he brings to the town or she brings to the town. And, uh, and, and so this is ingrained in our, in our DNA as uh, uh, mining people. You know, we, we care about the environment because we live in the environment. We're the first people to get there. And uh, oftentimes we are the, the custodians of more than just the operation, but the custodians of the environment, of the, of the people, of the good, the, the good community that we, that we actually live in. And we care about that stuff. That's where we grow up. That's where we live. That's where we raise our families. So, look, we are, uh, we are we, the mining industry are outstanding on ESG. We just don't do a great job of telling everybody about it. And uh, I think we've both spoken up to that, uh, that great work we do. Look at what's happening in the United States and in Canada today, recognizing that the entire uh, electrification thrust is reliant on the supply of metals, the responsible supply of metals. And so we have governments now uh, asking companies to, to produce these metals and do so domestically uh, because we do it well, and uh, we should be proud of that. And in the case of gold, it underpins our financial system. Without it, we do not have a functioning global financial system. Uh, and we are essential to the quality of life that uh, we all uh, enjoy on this planet. So we better do our jobs. We better do it right. Um, and we better get good recognition for that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's, it's one of those things. You, you get good recognition for when, when the industry, you know, as, as, as a whole communicates better about you know the, the need for whatever it is it's, it's pulling out of the ground like you know the, there's a lot of kind of a lot of push against you guys um there's a lot of misinformation uh, about about mining broadly and you know the, the the industry needs to come come together and um at least you know communicate more clearly um f- for sure um just just on so just and i just want to kind of finish off on something it's picking up something i think you've said or each of you said a few times which is around jurisdiction right yeah you've said right you all three of you operate in good jurisdictions and i i would agree with that but it's it seems to me it's got harder to actually define what a tier one jurisdiction is anymore partly because of the esg components whether it be ngos first nations activity or just you know um some disinterest from um, politicians to kind of fight fight that uh narrative in the marketplace at the moment so Gerald, if I, if I come, I'll come to you. you. You've operated in different places around the world. You said, I don't want to go back and work in Africa again um, in this conversation. What does, what does tier one mean anymore? I think it can be defined in very different way. I mean, uh, a tier one, uh, you know, if, if you, uh, you, you can, you can put the Vitz waters ran in South Africa as a tier one destination because of the economics of the deposit. They mine more than a thousand million ounces there. You know, you can you can talk about uh, 
you know, what K92 is doing in, in Indonesia. I mean, it, this is still a tier one when you look at the asset, right? Uh, but, but at the same time, infrastructure is important. That's one of the most important uh, aspects. Uh, we talk about electricity in the ESG. If, if I go back on the ground at the con, I'm going to try to go back with electric driven scoop. And I will try also to do something in Yellow Knife that is very important. I will try to upgrade what's there for electrical because there's two power dam plus the Talston. But you know, the energy you use is parameters to be part of the tier one definition in today's world, in my mind. The biggest challenge of the dirt is because it's the sustainability, sustainability of not being able to do it locally. Like you pointed out, why should I buy my copper from somewhere else when I can produce it in the US? Why should I buy my, you know, it's like, it's all about that. Our problem today is because we rely too much on freight and shipping everything around the world. We produce the raw materials being shipped to China and then it's come back here. We should have a very good steel industry in North America. It should not be under pressure. These are little things, but in my mind, US, Canada, it's tier one. There's no question. To simplify what Jaha said, I mean, endowment first, right? Is your mineral endowment there? And but if it's if it's there and you can't mine it, uh, then you've got an issue. So yeah, it has the endowment has to be there, and you have to have the capacity to mine it. I mean, the setting to mine it, the infrastructure, the qualified workforce, and the regulatory uh, body and 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 structure to give you access to fast track permitting and um, where you're able to accompany uh, the local um, population and their concerns. So that's tier one. I mean, if, if you're having to fight your way to find endowment, to find the right to, to mine, then you're not tier one, that's for sure. Oftentimes, you know, these, and, and I agree entirely with the comment between Nathan Fleet, that you can't change the geology. That's not within our control to change. Uh, uh, you know, we can find more of it. And we can use uh, new technologies to find more of it, but uh, you can't change the geology. But what you can change is your approach to the project, to the community, uh, to the people around you that make the decisions. And we've seen that the examples where companies fail are where they haven't made those preparations in advance. It's uh, some of the things that Jerry was talking about earlier uh, in going to Cochrane and uh, identifying that a bus was needed or a bus stop was needed. And doing those things early counts an awful lot along the way. Uh, you know, I, I, I've been involved in projects in uh, foreign jurisdictions that some said could never be uh, operated successfully. And the difference was we put the right people in place, uh, put the time in and, you know, made the relationships matter. And, uh, and so I think that's that's key. People matter and projects uh, that are successful do the right things early on in the process to position themselves for success. I actually built Sulawaka watching all the mistake we did at Bully. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> Learn from your mistakes. Well, it was not my mistake. I was learning from their mistakes. <laughs> I was never, never involved at Bully. But I learned a lot from how they approach the whole thing. And, and uh, it's, it's a learning curve, like you said uh, before. The first project is always tough. I mean, you're, you're the first one in the new area. So everything has to be... Uh, learned from well there, there you go ladies and gentlemen i'm going to wrap it up there because it, i'm just, just conscious of your time um but and for investors listening to this or watching this there's some some big clues in there big clues uh, scattered with gold dust pardon the the, the pun uh, by these three guys so i want to thank uh, hugh agro ceo of revival gold philippe clotier uh, ceo of cartier resources and also jared panaton ceo of gold terra corp uh, gentlemen thank you very much for your time today and your knowledge and, and sharing it with us appreciate it have a great day thank you